Hi everybody, welcome and thank you for opening up and tuning in to my segment in the World Pranic Festival uh, 2020. Uh, I think some of you might know me, some of you might not. So let me give you a, a brief introduction to who I am. Um, I'm sure you've heard some phenomenal speakers and uh, people who lived the uh, uh, breatharian and pranic life. Uh, my angle is a bit different and uh, so let me introduce myself. My name is Kirby Dilanarol and I am a Christian priest and I live in Sri Lanka. And so because of my Christian heritage, uh, my understanding of uh, what is known as a pranic life uh, is slightly different. It's, uh, it's the same source of life that uh, we all live through. Uh, I truly believe that in uh, God we live and move and find our being. And so he is the sustainer of life. Uh, so, but my understanding comes from uh, a whole history of what they call Enedics, I-N-E-D-I-C-S, Enedics or Enedia, which is uh, the Latin name uh, for people who lived lives, long lives of fasting, you know, and that's a part of the Christian faith is fasting. But uh, this was not just fasting for periods of time, but living their life fasted. You know, so that was something that uh, came to me uh, some time ago, I think it's now maybe over seven, eight years ago, where uh, this lifestyle of fasting sort of uh, uh, happened to me, it just came to me. Uh, I liked fasting because uh, before I became a priest, I was uh, very much into the world and doing all the things that the, the world uh, was uh, enticing me to do, eating and drinking and uh, partying and doing all those things. And so um, when I wanted to become spiritual, uh, I went through the Bible because that's the reference point that I had. And I realized that uh, everyone in the Bible, when uh, they had a spiritual experience, they went uh, through a long time fast. And sometimes if you look at the uh, books in the Bible, uh, people like Moses fasted 40 days, 40 nights without water you know, uh, Jesus, 40 days, 40 nights, you know. And so there are these long extended fasts in the Bible and, you know, with long extended dry fasts. And so when I wanted to let go of that, that world that I was in uh, and I wanted to become more spiritual, I implemented fasting as one of the protocols that can uh, help me become closer to God. And that was my quest. My quest was not to fast. My quest was to actually get to know who God is and who the divine is and maybe some of you don't have the semantics and the wording that he is God but uh, in every man is a spirit and um, uh, that spirit I wanted to get to know who is that spirit in every single man who is that spirit who is the creator who is the infinite consciousness you know and so that my quest started like that and of course uh, fasting became a protocol to get to find out who the infinite spirit was. And um, so I adopted the fast that were in the Bible. And of course, uh, my spiritual life uh, grew. And um, the fasting was just an ends uh, to a mean. You know, it was not something that, um, that uh, uh, was, um, was, was, the, was the conclusion. It was just getting me somewhere. And, you know, in my uh, church life, uh, I have uh, nearly 600 churches in Sri Lanka. I have uh, literally thousands of people that I serve. And to serve them, we have to serve them uh, with different forms of service. You know, we have to serve them through love, through compassion, through ministry, through kindness, but also through power. You know, we are, when people need healing, they need to be healed. When people need uh, something shifted in their life, a dimensional shift, we need to have a power of the spirit to do that. And I realized that fasting and being able to let go of literally the dense material realm of the world and tap into the spirit allowed me to be a proper conduit of the spirit. So my take is that uh, the spirit wants to work through every single man, but the integrity of the antenna, because we are like antennas that uh, transmit the external spirit that is coming in into us and then through us and working through us. So we are like antennas. And so the integrity of the antenna has to be very clean. And so that antenna is our body. And so therefore detoxing the body, keeping the body light, 
like light, LIGHT light was important. And so that was, uh, that really helped me to channel Christ who was moving through me, to channel him who is moving through me to heal and to empower and to build and to um, restore people's lives, you know, and that's, I believe, what God wants to do. He wants to restore people's lives into health, into healing, into right, into marriages, into families, into, you know, he, he wants to restore people's life in, from broken relationships. Um, you know, he wants to restore our hearts, you know. And so, so to do that, I had to be a proper channel. And therefore, um, you know, fasting uh, and long-term fasting was something that I started uh, applying myself to. And as my intention was there, the Spirit just came upon me. And it was able, it was easy for me to just cut down on uh, my normal calories and my normal intake of food and the normal cycle of three meals a day and all that. And so uh, I was led into, uh, at one point, I think all of you might know and uh, also appreciate, uh, at one point when I first started, I was, I mean, I never was eating, you know, very little, just juice and tea, you know, wanted to keep myself very light and enjoying that consciousness. But as I, I grew in my faith and also grew in this consciousness, I realized that, uh, that I don't need to demonize food and I don't need to judge food as well. And so I started consuming uh, again after about a year of not eating at all. I started consuming small amounts of food and then uh, got set in a, a beautiful rhythm of uh, calorie restriction, you know, and that's what we do now. And so uh, right now I'm, uh, uh, how we live our lives is very, very few meals, uh, calorie restricted, uh, no, um, no uh, what we call sophisticated meals like cakes and chocolates and all that uh, on on uh, Monday to Friday, you know, but from Saturday and Sunday, we do uh, a little more calories than normal. Otherwise, it's about maybe 600 calories per day. And then on Saturday and Sunday, we allow ourselves to indulge a little more. And so I live with my wife and uh, my, my, uh, my wife's sister, and that's, uh, that's how we live. And so our culture of food is low calories as much as uh, as much as possible from Monday to Friday and Saturday and Sunday, uh, we uh, allow ourselves to enjoy uh, something more than that. But as you know, when your stomach has uh, shrunk and you, uh, you've been using only little calories from Monday to Friday to eat on the weekends, we don't eat on the weekends also more than one meal. You know, it's just probably that one meal and then very little after that, you know. So, um, yes, so that is basically where I am. And um, just to give you the biblical understanding of this type of lifestyle and what y'all are yearning for is in the Bible, and I'll read it to you um, from the book of Isaiah in chapter 11. It says it like this, and it's talking of the end or the final consciousness that is going to come and the, uh, the consciousness that man will live in. And so it says this, it says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, a little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw, so the lion has become a vegetarian, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, a nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and a weaned child shall put his hand on the wiper's den. And he says this, And they shall not hurt nor kill on my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, and the waters cover the sea. So you can see that right in the Bible, and this is just one passage, there are many passages like this, that God's heart is that nothing should die, and that um, everyone, everything should live and that should not be killing. And I'm sure many of us, uh, one of the reasons we step into this type of lifestyle is because we don't, um, uh, uh, we don't want to agree with the killing that is going on uh, with animals and, and our heart towards that. And that's what causes us to minimize our food. Uh, so that is one component and it's also there in the Bible. Um, also, uh, one of the main reasons that someone will be led to this is because of health reasons to eat the right types of food, knowing full well that calories uh, were made by a person called uh, Clement who wanted one centigrade of water 
to uh, one gram of water to increase by one centigrade you know uh, that's what a calorie is and it was done for steam engines you know and then there was a guy called Wilbur Atwater uh, in the 1800s or the 1900s who came in and used the same measurement of a calorie to make sure he was a part of the industrial revolution he wanted to make sure that he got the maximum amount of, amount of work from a human being and so he put the um, he put, uh, they decided that it would be 2,500 calories per person to work, you know, and the workforce started like that. And so, uh, as you and I both know that, that man does not need 2,500 calories, it will, depends on your metabolism, it depends on so many different aspects and elements of really how many calories you need. Now, I have, uh, I'm very active, uh, we run maybe uh, nearly we run at least five kilometers every day we do heat workouts all that on very minimal calories you know um, uh, my wife sometimes she works out twice a day but on minimal calories she doesn't do as as minimal as i do but she's on quite uh, quite uh, a restricted amount as well and she's training sometimes twi twice a day and so we are realizing that uh, uh, it's a myth that we need a certain amount of calories to burn to uh, to do the exercise in the way we do and my personal take is that every man has a ratio so uh, say we have uh, energy in our system that energy is managed and I call it the energy management system is managed according to a ratio so when I say ratio it means that someone's ratio could be different to mine so someone's ratio could be those people who don't understand this type of lifestyle can be 60-70% on glucose or 80% on glucose or carbs and then maybe only 10% on uh, some maybe adipose or, or ketones and then maybe only about 5% on uh, endocrine energy. Endocrine means where your glands and your hormones uh, uh, start putting out the right types of hormones to energize you. So, so it can be, there can be a huge difference uh, in the ratio. Now, I've, real, I've realized to cut down on my ratio. So my ratio is different. You know, we uh, don't do so much glucose or carbs at all. We will depend a lot on endocrine energy or what we call adrenals. You know, the adrenals uh, or just over your kidneys, you have adrenals and, and your stomach can, you know, puts out a lot of uh, hormones like uh, oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, uh, neuroepinephrine, all these hormones are created and the gut is a big part of creating those hormones and those hormones can really energize you. If you, if you can tap into that, uh, then it can energize you. So I think a, a large percentage of our ratio is dependent on those happy hormones to energize us. And um, believe me, we could, uh, you could stay up all night just because those happy hormones have, have supported you, you know. And so the glucose and the carbs are far, far less. And we don't, we hardly take any carbs and glucose. Uh, we do, but not a lot. And uh, um, uh, maybe adipose, your adipose, where if you have a bit of fat, your fat turns into ketones. And so ketone energy is also a big ratio that we uh, live on. And also we know something called autophagy that won the, uh, Nobel Prize of, for science where uh, the cells itself cannibalize each other and there are proteins in the cells and the waste in the cells are converted into energy. So our ratio may be more of that than what um, people depend on like uh, glucose and things like that. As you know, glucose can toxify your system, carbs can toxify your system, you feel heavy uh, and there's a weight on you. Uh, but this type of energy, the synthesization of this type of energy is very easy and, uh, and also uh, once you get used to it, uh, it's very accessible to your body. So these are all patterns and these patterns, these, these are chemical and electronic patterns that you can really make your body used to it. So there's a way your subconscious mind can be reprogrammed that it does not go into um, the pattern and the cycle of the uh, the way you've been energizing yourself uh, from your young days, you can shift that pattern and I'm sure many on in Pranic Festival are teaching that. Uh, I know Nicholas has a, uh, a, a group where he takes people to teach that. Uh, and so there's a way you can shift your body to start 
changing the ratios. There's a way you can shift your body so that uh, the, your energy management system changes and you, your ratio of endocrine adrenal energy can be much more, uh, autophagy can be much more efficient and you know, your metabolism on autophagy can be efficient and your, uh, uh, your ability to tap into adipose and ketones can be much more efficient than uh, tapping into glucose. But those are all neural pathways, motor functions, all working together and how you get your central nervous system to actually be able to access those, uh, uh, those pathways, those metabolic pathways is, is something that every person can do and can actually uh, reprogram your subconscious mind to do that. So we are used to doing things in certain ways. We are used to um, uh, uh, tapping into energy in certain ways. We are used to exercising in certain ways. And this can be reprogrammed. I myself do something called a five-day program. But my five-day program is not so much to make people breatharian or pranic. My five-day program has a lot to do with tapping into uh, spiritual the, the spirit and getting to know who Christ is so that he can empower your life uh, in terms of healing and miracles and, um, uh, and weird signs and wonders and stuff like that, what we call signs and wonders. Okay, so, but, but, it's a, but there's an aspect of fasting in it. So, but I mean, I, uh, when we went into on a long fast, like my 40 day fast and stuff like that, there were times that I went for long periods without water as well. And those fasts that I did, uh, my, when I did 40 days, I would just be trying to drink water only. Some days I would be doing no water, doing dry fasting. And those 40 day fasts really literally shifted my metabolism. And I think what it did was it uh, fine tuned uh, um, what they call the mitochondria in our system. These fasts actually train the mitochondria to be able to be very efficient. The mitochondria uh, has the ability to process not just uh, uh, glucose, you can train the mitochondria to uh, process light, literally uh, the hormones as well, but also light, you know, and uh, uh, someone needs to do a scientific research on how much of, not just on endocrine energy we are living on, but actually on how much of light, because there is a transfer of light as well that we live on. I've, I mean, for instance, uh, I meditate every day out in the sun. You know, we I get maybe uh, at least half an hour sun a day. You know, when it's like one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon in Sri Lanka, you must understand it's a very very hot country. And I'm out in the sun, just meditating, receiving the sun, and I do really literally feel uh, my appetite uh, and my desire for food really get suppressed. And uh, why? Why is that? Because somehow my body has the ability to uh, receive sunlight as uh, some sort of, uh, there's an energy reaction, something happens. Literally scientists will even explain to you that vitamin D, uh, the best uh, way you can get vitamin D is through sunlight. Now, uh, if they can measure vitamin D like that, they need to measure other things. What is the transfer of energy uh, with the sunlight that happens, you know? Uh, so there, there are subtle energies that are far greater, for instance, now, the, the subtler the energy, the more ability it has to uh, really give matter uh, what it really needs, you know, because matter is uh, uh, changed on the most, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the smallest level. Matter is influenced on the most quantum level. And so uh, someone needs to study subtle energies and understand how subtle energies can shift matter and cause the right chemical reactions, the right electrical reactions so that we can get energized and um, uh, yeah so I'm sure people have done the research on it and they're doing the research on uh, that type of uh, energy that we've been experiencing. We as spiritual people can only explain it in this very simple language um, and I'm sure the scientists and the doctors will be able to in the future explain it in a better way. But um, yeah so that is uh, our, our lifestyle that we've been living and uh, my this is my uh, side of the story or this is my part of my contribution uh, to uh, this kind of lifestyle and we've been doing this for the last I mean may maybe seven eight years and we're very fit um, we have been checked up by doctors and we got a clean uh, bill of health um, so yes so the, uh, it is recommended uh, to calorie restrict um, I don't know where you are in your consciousness I know there are some people who go uh, much deeper into this than uh, 
then I am in it and uh, that it depends on where you are led you know in your season in your consciousness you'll be led exactly where you're supposed to be and so this is where we are led uh, to in, uh, in in our journey and um, yes so so uh, this is my uh, experience and I would like to uh, uh, share just a little more if you don't mind on uh, the Christian tradition of uh, Breatharianism or in India and I'll explain it like this um, we surround ourselves uh, around the Holy Communion or what someone would call the Holy Sacrament so we would try at least once a day to get together and meditate on the Holy Communion and the reason for that is a very interesting reason that some of you pranics might uh, appreciate because the Holy Communion represents the body and the blood of Christ so just think about it like this. Uh, in, the, in the Bible, the whole story is that we, back in that whole story of Adam and Eve, you don't have to believe it in, uh, if you don't want to believe it as something that is factual, but you can even receive it psychologically or you can receive it as an archetype just to understand it. You see the story goes that in, in the beginning, Adam and Eve were supposed to, right there in the beginning, right there, they were supposed to eat of something called the tree of life. Now, we don't know what that was. And I, my personal take is that that was Christ or the spirit of Christ or the spirit of life right in the beginning. And we were supposed to eat of God. Uh, remember that in the Bible, it says, a man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So that means there's a proceeding knowledge and revelation and frequency that is coming that we can really be transformed and live. And this literally eating of this transformative revelation was going to make them to become like God. You know, they were going to become divine. So humanity was given the potential to eat of God himself and then end up all of us just being divine. But unfortunately, they ate off another tree and it was called a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they started eating off a tree that was right and wrong, good and evil, a tree of judgment. And they got locked down. Their consciousness was locked down to a realm where they could not ascend into the realm of the spirit. So they got caught into an ego consciousness. So constantly judging, evaluating what is good, what is bad, what is good, what is bad. So in this story, what happened was that right in the garden, the first killing of an animal happened. Okay. And uh, that in, after that killing of an animal, it seems that we chose, it was our choice because we had a choice to eat of life, of, of complete uh, divinity and, and uh, com uh, we, were, we were supposed to eat of spirit and live. But Unfortunately, we didn't. And so we chose death to bring us life. Okay, so an animal died. So we chose death. Something needs to die to bring us life. Okay, and that is why we eat. We eat because uh, somehow when you go back into the records, man chose this way that death will bring us life. And so something innocent has to die to bring us life. So whether it's an animal or whether it's a plant, some of you might just be having juice or some plants, but also plants are very conscious. And so we are the one who chose that something innocent has to die to bring us life. Now we know that plants are more innocent than meats and therefore plant-based diets are better because of the innocence of what they're carrying can give us stronger, longer life. And so this is in the Bible, this whole story. And so Jesus comes as the most innocent one. So he comes as the one who is completely innocent. And because he's innocent, he has the capacity to take every man's sins. Okay. So you must understand the backdrop of when Jesus came. So like every religion, the Jews at that time were having a temple system. And literally, they were sacrificing animals, innocent animals at the temple. So they were sacrificing doves and lambs, you see, very innocent animals. And they believed the sacrifice of these innocent animals protected their nation and their people 
from curses, from sickness, and all this. But you see, the thing is, when we look at that system in the temple of the sacrifices of animals, there is no difference between that and eating food. Because that is why we eat food. Something innocent dies, and then we can live a little longer. Whether it's a plant, whether it's a tree, whether it's an animal, it's innocent. And when something innocent dies, we can live a little longer. In fact, the more, more innocent it is, the longer and the better it is, the longer we can live and the better it is for us. For instance, that's why fish is better than uh, meats. And then that's why veggies are better than fish. Because the more innocent down the food chain it goes, the better it is for our body. And that's why we go back to the innocence of greens and no, and we want organic and not uh, contaminated. You see, we're looking for innocence. The more innocent it is, the better it is for us. It was in this uh, tradition and this world that Jesus came to. And so he presented, because he was so innocent, he's not done anything. He came as God into a body of a man, did not sin, and therefore, his understanding and what he teaches is that because he's innocent, he can take the sins of all the world because the container is pure. And then he will die instead of those people who have the sins. He takes the karma of all the world and therefore he dies. Okay, And so therefore, because he was innocent, it pays for all man's mistakes, sins, completely paid for, all karma. The cycle stops completely. So he breaks the karmic cycle by doing that. And now what he does, he offers himself now as food, and that's the communion. Now this food has paid completely. Nothing innocent has to die anymore when we take the communion, we are eating the most innocent of foods and therefore it's better than the organic, it is better than fish, it is better than wedges, it is the most innocent of food. The electromagnetic signature of the communion is more powerful than most food. And that is why the Christians focused their lives, their, the Enedics or the Breterian Christians focused their lives around the Holy Communion and tapped into that vibration signature because that had the power to heal us. So the presentation of the communion was the superfood of superfoods. So when we take the communion, it recalibrates literally your life and the old patterns that you were in or you had, the old patterns that you had gets broken, the karmic cycles, because this pays for all that. You know, and so there's an essence of eternity in the holy elements. So literally what happened, the, the cycle of death ended. Let me put it like this. It means I need, from the beginning, I need to eat, something needs to die to give me life. So constantly something needs to die to make me live a little longer. Now you see that pattern. That's why in the temples they would sacrifice innocent things. So there's no difference between sacrificing innocent animals in a temple and killing an animal or a plant or a tree and eating that on your plate. Something innocent dies to give you life. Okay, so this cycle is going down through generations, through generations, through gener generations. Innocent dies that you can have more life. Innocent dies so that you can have more life constantly and continuously. So Jesus comes and it's the only food that can pay for the cycle to break. Let me tell you like this. Just because an innocent tree or an innocent lamb or an innocent dove dies, it doesn't settle it. It doesn't have the power to settle it because they needed the most innocent with the intention to come. And that was Jesus. So that is why the communion is uh, for me a uh, very powerful superfood and my meditation on it gets me healed, gets me younger, gives me power uh, to move uh, in healings and miracles and all that. And so that is why uh, Christians 
surround their breatharian life or their, their pranic life, they surround it around the meditation of what we call the Lord's Supper or the Holy Communion. So I hope uh, that has helped anyone to understand this consciousness, the Christian aspect uh, of uh, the consciousness of the pranic life. Uh, and um, I mean, if you have any questions, please do write to me and uh, I'll try my best to answer you guys. Okay, so my blessings to the Pranic Festival and everyone watching and may you be healed, may you be restored, uh, may you live long and may you be blessed.